This Fusion 360 foundational concept video will cover a few different topics. We will start by covering what design intent refers to while modeling, then move on to different assembly modeling techniques, and finally finish with what the Fusion 360 community is calling rule number one. So let's begin. When modeling or making anything in a 3D design tool like Fusion 360, there is never a shortage of different ways of making the same geometry. Take this model for example. Here you can see I have three bodies with the exact same geometry, but the path chosen in each case was widely different. Let's roll back in the timeline and focus on one of these methods. As you can see in this case, this geometry was made with one single sketch and feature. This method may make it seem like the best or most efficient method. However, when we dig down into it and activate the sketch behind the revolve feature that made this, you can see it is not as simple as what catches the eye. Here you can see the dimensions on top of dimensions, all defining each and every nook and cranny of this model. This can make it difficult to edit this design later when a design change is required. Another method one could take to make this is the opposite end of the spectrum, what I call the layer caked approach. With this method, the simplest of sketches are made, circles, then using a extrude feature, a cylinder is made. This process is repeated five times over, but in the end, the geometry is the exact same. But what do we have to do for future edits? Finding the correct feature to edit could be difficult, especially if every component is designed in this manner in a large assembly. So while the sketches are now simple, digging through the timeline is now difficult. Now let's come to another method, the machinist method. We're now treating this approach as if we were turning this part on a lathe, where we might start with some stock, then use subtractive methods to create revolved cuts from said stock. This method is great in the sense that the designer is thinking about the intricacies of making something like this, helping ensure the manufacturability of this design. But it is also limiting in the same sense, especially if your company is starting to leverage additive manufacturing techniques. So at the end of the day, there are pros and cons to consider for each case. And while there is not a right or wrong way to make a model, there are sometimes better ways. What I've always told new users is that if you have any idea how your design might need to change in the design process, that you should make it in a way to make those changes more efficient. With that in mind, let's look at some different approaches to designing an assembly. In the first case, I have made this handle in its own design. To make sure that it fit, I use a measurement from the screw shaft to create the cutout in the bottom of this component. Now all that is needed is to insert the handle into my assembly. Simple enough. Should the part not fit, we can open up the handle design and make the required changes. This is what is commonly referred to as bottom-up design and is the traditional approach. One downside to this technique is the need to manage more files. On the other hand, this technique ensures that components can be reused across multiple assemblies. Our next assembly modeling approach is the top-down design approach. The next part I need is the protractor. In top-down design, parts, shapes, sizes, and locations can be designed in context to the other components. This technique ensures that components fit together more efficiently and components can be driven off each other. Before I do anything else, I want to adhere to rule number one, a rule other members of the Fusion 360 community have found to be helpful when designing in this manner. Rule number one is to create a new component and activate it before making this. This will help ensure that the feature made during the next steps are contained fully within this component. This helps in locating and editing features that pertain to a particular component further down in the development process. Anyway, using this method, I can properly position the circular sketch centered on the hinge bolt, and it starts as, as simple as that. When I go to extrude this, Fusion 360 has found the profiles for the hinge bolt and the mounting screws, which helps me avoid interferences with those existing pieces. I'll then apply a simple chamfer. And in the next step, I want to create the counterbores for the small bolts. Dropping in the points before accessing the whole feature is simple, again, aided by the existing geometry. Next, I want the protractor edge to follow the existing edges of the base and side. To ensure this is the case, I'll project those faces into this sketch. Then draw two simple lines to close off the gap between these. In no time again, I'm able to extrude this. After that, a fillet is added and this is done. But now I need to connect this to other components. A joint will not be used here. 
because it is placed exactly where I need it. Instead, I'll use an as-built joint. This joint will require I select this part and another I want to relate it to, then define any required motion, or I can just make it rigid. Anyway, we hope that helps you understand the different design methods, assembly methods, and rule number one.